OK, I think we're all ready to go. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Why conservation matters. My name is Andrew Holland. I'm the National Media Relations Director with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and I'm your moderator today. The Nature Conservancy of Canada is a registered charity. The Nature Conservancy of Canada is the nation's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization working to protect our most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners have helped protect 14 million hectares or 35 million acres coast to coast to coast. To learn more, visit our website at natureconservancy.ca. Today's webinar is being presented by Dan Kraus. Dan is a senior conservation biologist with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Before we begin the webinar, I would like to quickly cover a few housekeeping topics. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing a link to the recording after the event, so please keep an eye on your inboxes. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your colleagues, family and friends. We also want you to join in on the conversation and share your thoughts with our online community. Feel free to connect with us through Facebook, Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag NCC Nature Talks during and after the webinar. We also invite your comments and questions today and you'll notice a question and answer Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for Dan Krause at any point, just type it in there and I'll pose it to him at the end of the webinar. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dan Krause and he's going to start today's webinar. Dan, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be speaking to everyone about something I'm passionate about, which is conservation in Canada and its importance. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a, a journey today, a, a bit of journey of how I discovered that uh, conservation in Canada is important. I hope by the end of my presentation, you'll feel both uh, informed and inspired about nature in Canada and the work that we do at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Now, I don't know if it's because I've, I've been at the Nature Conservancy of Canada for almost 18 years now, or maybe I'm just getting a little bit older, but I think a lot about this, this picture. This is a, a picture of just before when the Nature Conservancy of Canada was founded. And I can't help but think how much our world has changed since this picture was taken. There's twice as many people on the, the planet. Uh, the only satellite images we had of planet Earth were grainy black and white images taken from the Explorer and Troyo satellites. The very first lists of threatened species were just being published. The computer power, the computing power of the most powerful computers uh, is less than what's in your cell phone today. I think that one of the biggest changes are the massive changes though, that have happened to our, to our planet and really the upscaling of conservation issues from local and regional problems to, to things that are happening at the global scale. We know now that humans are having a profound impact on the face of our Earth. We live in an age that scientists sometimes refer to as the, the Anthropocene, the, the age of us, the age of humans. Over three quarters of the terrestrial ecosystems, excluding Antarctica, have been modified by people. Uh, over 70% of the planet's wilderness is just restricted to five countries, including Canada. And our human influence, our footprint extends into the oceans with almost 90% of marine ecosystems impacted by fishing, nutrient runoff and climate change. We know that we're pushing planetary limits. Over 200 years ago, Western society considered nature's resources to be endless, but we know now that this is untrue and we've actually started to, sur to surpass many of the Earth's limits. This includes climate change and pollution, such as nitrogen and phosphorus that can create dead zones or algae blooms in our lakes. But I want to focus on the one that we're pushing the limits the hardest on, and that's the loss of biodiversity, the, the loss of nature. We're entering into a period that is sometimes referred to as a sixth extinction. Extinctions one to five were caused by things like asteroids hitting the earth and volcanic activity, but this one is because of us and what we're doing to the face of, of our planet. Extinction rates are much greater than, than natural background levels and many species are experiencing rapid population declines. A report that was just released last year identified that up to 1 million species could be at risk of extinction on planet Earth in the coming decades if we don't change our course. 
And Canada plays an integral role in, in all of this. Uh, this is a map that shows our human influence on our country. Those green areas are places where we still have wilderness, some of those last places of global wilderness left on the planet. But in southern Canada, those areas in yellow and red are places where we've had a profound impact on the species and ecosystems uh, uh, of Canada. Some of those places, if they were independent countries, would have habitat loss uh, and, and historic and current rates of habitat loss that equal uh, any other some of the, the places on Earth that we see as sort of the, the poster nations for biodiversity decline. This loss of habitat is being felt in all of our different ecosystems. This report that was done about 10 years ago identified that in all our major biomes across the country, they are declining. Uh, in particular, our grassland ecosystems are being lost at a rapid rate. And in Canada's north, our, our ice ecosystems are melting because of rapid climate change. Our list of Canadian wildlife at risk is continuing to grow. We now have over 800 species that have been assessed as at risk uh, within our country. Um, this includes species like uh, like Eastern Mountain Havens, the lovely yellow flower there, which NCC is protected on Briar Island in Nova Scotia, species that have small ranges and small populations, but also species like the monarch butterfly, where we still have many of them, but their populations are rapidly declining. So what is Canada's role? Why does protecting nature in Canada matter? Well, before I, I kind of get into it, I want to just give you a quick sort of uh, maybe flashback to your grade 10 geography class and remind you about two facts of our, our country. We're both a very large country and a very small country. While Canada has about 6% of the world's terrestrial real estate, only about one in every 202 people on earth today are, are lucky enough by chance or by choice to be Canadian. When I was first starting to study conservation biology, I'd look at maps like this showing, showing hotspots of biodiversity. And I remember thinking, what is the role of my country? I can even remember kind of looking at that California floristic province and, and trying to think, well, maybe it just kind of extends a little further north into, into British Columbia. But I spent most of my, my university years kind of thinking that, you know, Canada was this great white north. It was a blank spot in the map of biodiversity, a, a snowy, frozen land with low biodiversity. Now, certainly we do have less species in many tropical countries. This is a phenomenon that's, that's well known for most groups of plants and animals, that there's more in the tropics than in temperate regions, basically because evolution has had a longer time to, to occur. There are some exceptions like lichens and pines and a few marine species, but we do generally have fewer species than tropical countries. But we have other things that the rest of the world doesn't have, and I want to share some of those with you today. Our country has the longest marine and freshwater coastlines in the world. Uh, our marine coastline is over 250,000 kilometers. Uh, that's longer than the combined marine coastlines of Russia and the United States. Our country is dominated by, by uh, freshwater ecosystems. We have a quarter of the world's wetlands and we have more freshwater lakes than any other country in the world. These lake regions that we so often spend our summers in, often Canadians think that these are, these are common and widespread places, but from a global perspective, the places that we have our camps and our cottages and chalets are often ecosystems are quite unique from a, a global perspective. And we have large intact forests. Ask a, a Canadian, a friend or a neighbor to name where they think that the deepest, darkest forest is left on planet Earth. And often they'll answer places like the Amazon or the Congo. But the truth is it's here in Canada where we have some of the world's largest remaining intact forests left on, left on Earth. These northern forests and our wetlands are also critically important for the planet because of the, the carbon that they store in these peatlands. We sometimes refer to these as, as muskegs. These are the world's carbon storehouse. They hold more carbon than tropical rainforests, and Canada has a huge amount of this global carbon. 
We also have vegetation communities that are of global conservation concern. Now we need to do a better job of this. We haven't really cataloged these globally rare ecosystems very well, but we know they occur in places such as Atlantic Canada, these broom crowberry barrens that you find on rock and sand, going to the west coast in British Columbia, Gary Oak Savannah, and around the Great Lakes near where I live, we have all kinds of unique ecological systems that are quite globally rare and unique. And the list goes on and on. Our aspen parklands, tall grass prairies, uh, Canada has many, many ecosystems that uh, only occur here and many of which that are of global conservation concern. We also have many species that are rare. We have over a thousand wildlife species that are not just rare in your province or in your country, but are of global conservation concern. This includes dozens of species like the Atlantic whitefish found in Nova Scotia, Blanding's turtle in Eastern Canada, or the white bark pine of the Rocky Mountains that are from a global perspective at greater risk of extinction than species like the African elephant. We also have an abundance of wildlife that the world is rapidly losing. Earlier this spring, billions of birds migrated north from the United States, Central America and beyond to breed uh, in our, our northern forests and throughout Canada to take advantage of our the burst of productivity. Uh, to raise their to raise their young. We have huge concentrations of shorebirds in places like Johnson's Mills, and we have some of the, lar the largest and longest mammal migrations uh, left on planet Earth. Now, why are these places important? Now, for me, I mean, nature in itself is, is critically important. And as a scientist, I, I look at places like this, that the Nature Conservancy of Canada has protected, and I would describe them in terms like this, that protected areas, rare species, and you know, these are, are this, this is important reason to protect nature, and probably many of you listening, you know, this is reason enough. But there's other reasons why people value nature as well, and I think it's important that we think about those reasons as well. Nature is an integral part of our economy, our well-being, and our health. And we can think about how we value nature in other terms as well. Uh, for example, nature holds back floodwaters during extreme storm events. In our coastal areas, habitats like salt marshes can prevent storm surges uh, protecting our coastal communities. And I think one of the, the things that's really starting to, to take hold is the impact of nature on our physical and mental health. Uh, it's not something that's just in our head. It is something that, that affects our, our bodies. For example, there's increasing studies that are showing that we were, when we're out in nature, we're exposed to different bacteria that actually become part of us, that become part of the bacteria that live on our bodies and in our, in our gut and can actually make us, make us healthier. We also live in a country where there's a strong level of support for nature conservation. And it's important to remember that support for conservation is not divided, uh, it's just diverse. And that diversity relates to the, the reasons I just showed on the previous slide. About nine in 10 Canadians agree that we need more protected areas and that we want to protect the plants and animals that we have in Canada and save them from extinction. As Canadians, it's also important that we remember we're building on a rich history of conservation in our country. We have civil societies that date back uh, to the, the 1870s that were founded to understand and to protect nature. We have some of the world's first national parks. Now, certainly some of those first national parks have a history of colonization and displacement of First Nations. That's a history we all need to know and be aware of. Now, often people think of, of Banff as our, our first national park, but I want you to think about another place too called Last Mountain Lake Bird Sanctuary. I think this one's important. It's in Saskatchewan because in many ways, this is one of the first protected areas on earth that was designed solely to protect nature. While Banff and Yellowstone, the US were set aside largely initially to protect areas for tourism, Last Mountain Lake Sanctuary was set aside to protect migratory birds. And it wasn't an idea until our, that our American neighbors didn't pick up until 1903. We're also building on a rich success of conservation. We're also building on a rich legacy of conservation success in, in Canada. 
a history that goes back that um, over over 150 years. Things like the exploitation of species that occurred with bison or wood duck, we've largely solved those issues. There are certainly some species where it's still a problem, but but most species are not declining now because of, of over exploitation in Canada. We've done things like ban DDT, which was a chemical that would accumulate in the bodies of, of birds and cause reproductive failure and was causing many species of raptors like bald eagles or osprey. Uh, peregrine falcon or other birds like American white pelican to drop in in populations. And we have incredible examples of where we've brought wildlife back from the edge. Uh, swift fox, which was extirpated from Canada, which meant it was gone from Canada, has been reintroduced and is doing quite well in some parts of our, our country. So why does conservation matter? Well, it certainly matters for nature, but I think the main thing is that it matters for, for everyone. One of the things that we need to do is sort of change our model about how we think of nature. Traditionally, we've thought of nature as these isolated, protected places that will be set in a human dominated landscape. But really, we need to change that into one which nature is set within our, our human culture. And everything we do is embedded in protecting and restoring nature. A lot has certainly changed since 1961 when NCC was, was founded. Part of the reason why I'm so passionate and committed to this organization as a staff member and as a donor is because the world needs nature now more than ever. Our aim as an organization remains true and our mission critical. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, we have uh, some questions that have been submitted in the chat box and as a reminder if you have a question that uh, you have not submitted yet uh, please enter it using the Q&A chat box feature and we will get through as many questions uh, as time allows this afternoon and, and comments as well. Uh, Dan, just to start this off, we uh, in, in the uh, questions uh, Harleen asks would you say that a majority of these extinctions, uh, and these are species extinctions you touched on earlier, would you say that a majority of them come from higher populated areas such as southern Canada? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, mo most of the species that have become extinct in Canada have had this has occurred because of two reasons. Uh, historically, it was over exploitation. So we have species like the great auk, uh, passenger pigeon, uh, sea mink on the east coast uh, that that definitely became lost because of over exploitation. Uh, most of the, the ones since that time, it has been because of habitat loss. And that includes things like Maycoon shiny moss, which was a, a moss that was endemic to Canada, only lived in Canada, found in eastern Ontario uh, that has not been seen for over a century because of habitat loss, uh, to species like Vancouver Island Blue, which is a, a small butterfly that has not been seen for decades uh, near Victoria and is likely gone from Canada because of, of habitat loss. Another question is, uh, what are the opportunities for scientists who aren't trained in biology to work in conservation and find roles to protect our biodiversity? That's a good question. You know, certainly conservation needs everybody. And I think that that's one of the, the things that we're, we're realizing. It can't just be done by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. It can't just be done by, by government or by a corporation. It really needs us all to, to participate. Oh, I might get into trouble saying this, but you know, in some ways people that are not trained in conservation can be the best messengers about conservation. We have uh, lots of wonderful conservation scientists at the Nature Conservancy of Canada that are very passionate about a particular species or an ecosystem, and it can be very infectious to, to listen to them. But I've also heard very powerful messages about conservation coming from engineers talking about the need for resilience of our coastal systems, from medical doctors talking about the need for people to uh, be out in, in nature, from teachers talking about the need for kids to uh, experience nature because it increases their, their creativity. So I think we, we all have a role and there's nothing wrong with talking about nature 
in terms of the way that you value it. So it may not be about species at risk or key biodiversity areas, but speaking about nature uh, for the reasons why you find it's important. Joyce is asking, how is the Nature Conservancy of Canada protecting the shorelines where migratory birds stop over? And one of those sites uh, you alluded to earlier is the Johnson's Mills Shorebird Reserve, where uh, you know hundreds of thousands of birds fly in from the Arctic to uh, to nest and uh, double their body weight here. Yeah. This is critical that we, we protect some of these key areas for migratory birds. Uh, some birds, when they come through, they're very diffuse in terms of where they are, but there, there are some key areas where we know that they congregate. Um, I'd like to think of these migratory stopover sites as kind of like a, the Tim Hortons for migratory birds. Like they, they go there because it, they want a quick stop, they need to refuel before they continue their, their journey. The good news is, is that we generally know where most of these migratory hotspots are, uh, and most of them are places where the Nature Conservancy of Canada is working to, to protect them. Now, just protecting the area is sometimes not enough. There may need to be some management as well that occurs in, the, in these places, and that can, in, that can include um, uh, recreational activities and making sure you know, people don't have their dogs running on the beach, which can you know, cause thousands of birds to take flight and expend a lot of energy and energy they need to kind of make their trip and to, to raise the next generation. So it is something that at Nature Conservancy of Canada we, we've focused on for a long time and will continue to focus on. Chantal Lyons is asking, are forest fires becoming more frequent in Canada as in the United States? And if so, how is this expected to shape ecosystems over the next few decades? Um, so the, the short answer is yes, we are seeing more, more fires in many places uh, of Canada. This is happening for, for two reasons. Um, the one is certainly many parts of Canada, in particular uh, Western and Northern Canada, seem to be getting drier, uh, which is likely a, a result of climate change. The other reason, uh, is because we've been suppressing fires for a very, very long time. So many of Canada's forest ecosystems are fire dependent. Fire has been part of the natural process for, for centuries. In many cases, Indigenous peoples manage those landscapes through managed fires. We've kind of taken that process away for the last hundred years. And as a result, we have this building up of, of fuel loads. Uh, as those fuel loads build up, what can happen is we end up with not just these small fires that kind of burned under, under trees, but large catastrophic fires that can that can change ecosystems. So one of the things that we, we need to do, uh, in addition to uh, reducing the impact of climate change, is to think about how we manage uh, how we manage fire on the landscape. And there certainly are a lot of lessons we can take from Indigenous peoples in terms of having these more frequent light fires as opposed to suppressing those fires and, and uh, having these catastrophic fires that do have a major impact on uh, ecosystems and communities. Dan, uh, here's another question. How do you think climate change is impacting the way conservation is done? With climate change, changing habitat ranges, does conservation become less about preservation and more about adaptive management? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Climate change is certainly um, causing us to rethink about our traditional approaches to protecting nature. Uh, we know now that we need to give species um, more room to adapt and more opportunities to shift in range. So one thing that we're looking at in many places of Canada is how can we increase the number of wildlife corridors between protected areas. Uh, we're doing this work really across across the country so that nature has an opportunity to shift as we as we as our climate changes very, very rapidly. Excellent. Well, that uh, summarizes the questions that we've had uh, here today. And uh, there, there was another comment uh, that was made a bit earlier to a or asking to see if there's a way to maybe connect with you on Conservation Matters via LinkedIn and email. So uh, that was from an earlier questioner that obviously uh, appreciated your response. So I'll, I'll mention that to you and I'll share their coordinates with you privately, I guess. And we want to thank everybody for, for participating and everybody who's uh, joined us for today's uh, webinar and Dan, uh, thank you for sharing uh, your insight and expertise today. If you have any additional questions or comments regarding uh, today's webinar or would like to uh, contact the Nature Conservancy of Canada, 
Uh, you can do so by reaching out to us directly and by emailing events at natureconservancy.ca. And if you're interested in our other upcoming webinars, please visit uh, the following link and you'll see that on your screen for more information on how to register. Uh, so there'll be another uh, few uh, webinars coming up in, in the coming weeks, including one uh, really good one on Dan's uh, endemic species report with uh, NatureServe Canada. Uh, so if you're interested in, in those upcoming webinars, again, please visit the following link and uh, stay tuned uh, for the link to today's webinar recording. You'll receive that in our follow up email within the next uh, 24 hours or so. So on behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, thank you again for your participation today. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you next time.